What was your role actually in the Navy? So I ran the nuclear power plants on board aircraft carriers. Okay. So um, at the time I was uh, on the USS Abraham Lincoln. At the time it was the newest and finest. Um, now it's just the finest, but uh, um, we ran the power plants there and also it was a, a ship driver. But what I really loved is, is doing the operations of the plant. Interesting. Were very hands-on as an engineer within the Navy. Very much so. And always thinking what, what could go wrong, running the drills um, and, and being prepared for that and always sharing information, right? Whenever we learned something from one ship, we would share it with the other ships uh, so that we were all getting better. And I think uh, that's powerful in an industry or even within a company. And why did you leave the Navy? Do you remember 1992 when peace yeah. broke out? Yeah. Right. The evil empire had uh, had dissolved. Uh, yeah. There was uh, budget cuts and I loved deploying. I, I loved my job, but it was tough on the family. You know, when people say thank you for your service, I'm like, I had fun. Right. Thank the families that are left behind that have to deal with all the things. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it and thought, I, I don't know that my marriage and my family will survive another deployment. So at that point, I decided, well, I'm going to go from one stable, steady job to another, right? So I'm going to go working from the for the government to I'll work for a uh, a big Fortune 500 company, and that's the thing to do. And what I realized is that stability comes from your ability to produce. And I was I wasn't happy in big companies. Um, I I liked being out there on my own, and I think I was an entrepreneur from an early age. It's just the culture that I was brought up in uh, was taught to me that that's risky, that's scary. You shouldn't do that. Uh, you know, you should be uh, an employee, get a paycheck, um, and stick around till you get the watch. We'll, we'll talk about your 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 time in, in Striker in, in in a minute. I, I just want to ask the question because I'm mean, I'm most intrigued. That transition from such uh, uh, sort of rigidity, such such structure in the navy. What was the actual transition into civilian life? Was was it was it a struggle? Was it to to go back? I know you said you transitioned into a corporate, but was that was that going back into civilian life a difficulty for you? Yes and no. I think the company that that recruited me they got a lot of ex junior military officers okay. and we got out of, of the military and you were always, you know, there before the troops showed up, you left after the troops uh, left, you know, the definition of a half day in the military was 12 hours, right? You can work any, any 12 you want. So all of a sudden we got into the corporate world and you'd work really hard. You know, you were, you were there at 5 a.m. Uh, you were there for 5 p.m. meetings. Uh, you were there on Saturdays to get caught up for the next week. And we would joke that it took us about a year to realize that most civilians don't do that. Mm -hmm. And by that time, we were successful. We'd been promoted a couple of times and um, it just kept that work ethic up. Interesting. So, so you went to Striker and you, you, you were in sales, distribution, operations, all the stuff you were saying that operations in, in, in the Navy into medical devices. So what was your favorite bit about that role? Because you were there for 12 years. What, what, why did you stay so long? Why did, what did you enjoy about the role? Because I got to change a role. So I got, I got hired as an engineer and I was an engineer for the better part of about three months then got promoted to production supervisor, then distribution manager. And at the 18 month point mark, I hated it because I was in a building. And if, if you didn't like work in the same building, if you didn't live within a hundred yards of me, if you didn't go to church with me and sit a pew ahead or a pew behind, I didn't know you. And I'm like, I hate this job. It feels like I'm back on the ship. But I had the opportunity to go out there and, and work with some of the sales reps, work in the, the theater or the, the operating rooms. And I'm like, this is exciting. This is, this is what I want to do. And so originally, um, Stryker said, no, engineers don't sell. People from the inside don't go to the outside. So I took this little sabbatical, sold for a company that was a competitor for about 18 months. 
And they're like, wow, this guy really can sell. So I got brought back uh, into a different division and I, I loved it. It was uh, every day was a new challenge. It was more entrepreneurial. And then I got to run my own distributorship um, in, uh, in Michigan here. And so in some ways I thought I had a business, but what I realized that I just had one client. Right, right. And then you moved on to um, the owner of Goodbye Crutches, which was selling medical equipment. So was that your first entrepreneurial endeavor? I would say that was my first one, because remember, again, in about 2008, right, um, Michigan led the, uh, the, the U.S. into the Great Recession. And so the distributor, the manufacturer, came to me and said, we want to cut out the middleman, which makes total sense, right? Until you look in the mirror and you go, I'm the middleman, right? And they, they did right by me and everything. But after we sold that distributorship, we had a sideline business. And it was direct to patient, durable medical equipment rental, right? It's, it's about the most unsexiest thing you can be in there. But we had just done it in Michigan. And my wife and I looked at it. And about half of the rentals we got back came with thank you notes. We knew we were doing good in the world. We just didn't know if we could scale it. And at that time, you know, there was no way I was going to do brick and mortar going into a recession. So I had read a book by two smart guys out of MIT, uh, Brian Halligan and Darmesh Saw, that went on to form HubSpot. And I read the book and I thought, this should work for e-commerce and reached out to the company. And they're like, yeah, it should. Nobody's ever tried it. And I'm like, well, let's give it a go there. And we ended up being their first e-commerce case study, uh, Beretta USA, which is the oldest company in the world, was their second um, second case study. And um, and so, how many was was in the company? How much did the co- how many people in the company did it build to? Yeah, so we had six people that were all based in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and that taught me that you know, with the internet now, you can be pretty much any place, right? We had distribution centers throughout the United States, but all of our team was in in Kalamazoo. The other thing that taught me is that trying to find talent locally can be really, really tough, right? We had a small pool that we could uh, pull from. And we were, we were at that point serving just the United States. And it's not fair to a company to say we're open nine to five East Coast time unless it snows right? They don't care about that. So I realized the importance of having a remote company. um, And, you know, I I did, after a while, I didn't like going into the same office every day. And we started to get to the point where I can do most of this work just over the computer. Why do I have to drive in there? So that's why I intentionally said any business I do going forward will be remote. And what happened to it? Did you, did you close it? Did you sell it? What, what, what happened? we built it up and sold it, sold it off. Um, the market was changing, and I'm glad we sold it when we did. E-commerce back, you know, 2008 to 2014 was so less competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, now everything goes through through Amazon, and it's really tough. And we saw that coming. Um, and we also had just one small product, right? There was it was really hard to scale into other products. I didn't want to, so we were able to sell that sell that off. What was your experience of selling the business? I left a lot of money on the table. And uh, my, my wife later pointed out something in my life that often the first two years, I'll beat my head against the wall trying to make it work. The second two years, um, I'll, it's going really well. It's really profitable. And then like the final two years, I'm just bored of it and want to go on to something else. I always want to keep learning. So um, I was in that point where it's, I was starting to get to the point where I was bored with it. It was just like, you know, um, take it. I'm not going to, it's not worth fighting over, um, you know, for the little bit of extra valuation. I wasn't, I didn't want to keep the business. So it's like, yeah, I want to go on to something else. And so that's intentionally now in my business. Now we're eight years in. So I always look and say, what am I doing to learn to challenge myself so that I don't hit that that uh, that stage again. 